Cruise tourism is big business. So big, in fact, that in 2009, before the COVID crash, the global cruise industry welcomed 29.7 million passengers. It created jobs for 1.8 million people around the world, and it contributed over 154 billion US dollars to the global economy. Cruise tourism is essentially a form of enclave tourism, and it encompasses all faces of the tourism industry. There's accommodation, transport, hospitality, attractions, it's got it all. Cruising has become the fastest growing segment in the travel industry across the world. And it's no surprise with the wide variety of cruises that are on offer these days. Cruise tourism is hugely popular around the world, but it's not all good and it can have some pretty negative impacts that need to be managed. Interested to learn more? Stay tuned. If you're new here, my name's Dr. Hayley Stainton and I'm here to teach you all things travel and tourism. So let's start at the beginning. What is cruise tourism? Cruise tourism refers to holidays which are entirely or partly based on a cruise ship. It enables tourists to experience a multi-centre holiday, whereby they spend time at various destinations throughout their trip. Cruise ships vary from small yachts to mega ships and can take place on the ocean, rivers or fjords. Cruise tourism is popular in the Caribbean, the Mediterranean, the Arctic and lots of other places too. In essence, cruise tourism is a luxurious form of travelling, usually anyway. It involves an all-inclusive holiday on a cruise ship that lasts at least 24 hours and it has a set and specific itinerary in which the cruise ship will call at different ports or cities. Cruise tourism is characterised by the concentration of large numbers of people who visit one particular destination all at the same time. Has cruise tourism always been big? Actually, cruise tourism does have a long and fruitful history. The first notable leisure cruising began with the formation of the Peninsula and Oriental Steam Navigation Company back in 1822. Whilst the company started out as a shipping line, it soon introduced round trips to a range of destinations. Over the next century, more and more cruise liners began to emerge around the world, and by the late 19th century, Albert Ballin, director of the Hamburg America Line, was the first to send his transatlantic ships out on long southern cruises during the worst of the winter season of the North Atlantic. Fast forward to the 1980s and we started to see the development of cruise ships that look closer to what we recognise today. The first mega ships were built and cruise ships gradually became bigger and bigger and more and more luxurious, with more onboard facilities than ever before. Nowadays, some modern cruise ships are so big that they cater for a capacity the size of a small city. Cruise ships have a wide range of onboard facilities and features, and there are cruise ship itineraries that cater for every type of person in every corner of the globe. So who organises these cruises? Let's take a look at some of the big names in the cruise tourism business. The cruise market is largely dominated by the big five names. We have Cunard who have been operating for more than 180 years. They specialise in luxury cruises with their famous White Star service. This formal and traditional cruise company is ideal for couples and for the older generation. Then we have Royal Caribbean. Royal Caribbean Cruises are the leading cruise company for innovation. They offer everything from surfing to Broadway shows. It's really exciting. The cruise line is popular amongst a wide range of cruise tourists, including families, couples and solo travellers. We then have P&O Cruises. This is the most popular cruise line in the UK. It appeals to a range of customer types, including families and couples. It offers traditional cruise products and services. Another big player is the Norwegian Cruise Line. It's really popular with UK cruise tourists as well as Europeans. And Norwegian Cruise Lines offers an American style service on board their ships. You can sail from the UK or you can book a fly cruise where you fly and then join your cruise ship. Princess Cruises are another big company and they offer sailings around the world using a traditional American style cruise approach. Princess Cruises are popular the world over with couples, families and premium travellers. So the cruise ships themselves are pretty remarkable. 
they have some incredible facilities on board and some of them are really big. Currently, the largest cruise ship is the Symphony of the Seas. Measuring more than 1,000 feet in length and with a gross tonnage of 228,081 across 18 decks, this ship is quite frankly an engineering marvel. The ship is able to accommodate 5,518 passengers at double occupancy up to a maximum capacity of 6,680 passengers as well as a 2,200 person crew. The Symphony of the Seas has everything you would expect from the largest cruise ship in the world. The cruise ship has 18 decks, 22 restaurants, 24 pools, 2,759 cabins and a park with over 20,000 tropical plants. But this ship will not be the biggest for long. Royal Caribbean International has announced that it will begin operations of its new Wonder of the Seas in 2022. This ship will measure 1,188 feet and it will be 217 feet wide. It will feature 18 decks and 2,867 staterooms. Wonder of the Seas will sail seven night itineraries to the Eastern and the Western Caribbean. So let's take a deeper look at what things are on board these ships because they are pretty cool. Cruise ships are pretty incredible. They will often have everything you could want on board. In fact, lots of them are like, just like a small city. It's fairly common among modern cruises for the following facilities to be found on board. A range of shops, a casino, a spa, swimming pools, theatres, cinemas, fitness centres, restaurants and bars. And whilst I have told you all about the biggest cruises in the world, there are actually lots of different types of cruise. So let's take a look at what these are. River cruise. Many destinations are popular for river cruising. River cruising is different from ocean cruising because passengers are really close to shore and the focus of the cruise is more on sightseeing and visionary landscape. During river cruises, passengers tend to step offshore and these excursions are typically free of charge. The facilities on board a river cruise are kept to a minimum and they're generally restricted due to the smaller size of the ship. Of course, it needs to fit down the river. Typically, river cruise ships will hold no more than 100 to 200 passengers, whereas ocean cruises can hold thousands. Expedition cruise. Expedition cruising is smaller in its scale, offering niche experiences with shore landings via an inflatable boat to access remote locations. The purpose of expedition cruising is to take part in a, a comprehensive adventure and educational experience. More often than not, expedition cruises specialise in voyages that offer nature or wildlife based experiences in areas like Northern Europe, Alaska or the Arctic. Mega Cruise Mega cruises are the biggest cruise ships yet, including ships such as the Symphony of the Seas and Norwegian Bliss. Mega cruise ships are a new class of cruise vessel and they focus on maximising capacity and onboard services. Some mega ships can hold more than 5,000 passengers. The Oasis series built by Royal Caribbean International, Oasis, Allure, Harmony and Symphony of the Seas can each hold around 6,700 people. Yacht. Yacht cruising is particularly small in scale when we compare it to luxury or mega cruising. However, yacht cruising can be similar to luxury cruising in that it is very expensive and it can have very high standards of service and facilities on board. Yachts hold fewer passengers than other cruise vessels and usually a family or a group of people will hire an entire yacht and cruise the seas. There are many places that are really popular for this type of cruise tourism, such as Greece or the Whit Sundays in Australia. Luxury Cruise Many types of cruise that we have talked about here can also be considered luxury. Luxury cruises tend to have a lower staff to passenger ratio and a premium class of service throughout. And the sky is the limit when it comes to pricing. Okay, so this all sounds pretty fun, right? But where? Where are people going? The Caribbean. Caribbean cruises are a popular choice for cruise tourists as the weather in the Caribbean is generally good all year round. 
Whilst the cruise tourism industry in the Caribbean is large, the economic and environmental impacts are often the centre of discussion amongst academics and practitioners. It's definitely something to consider, and I will talk about that more shortly. The Mediterranean. Similarly to the Caribbean, the Mediterranean has always been a very popular cruise destination. Particularly, this is the case because it has a warm climate, in most parts, all year round. And there are so many great places to visit around the Mediterranean, from Barcelona to Venice to Malta and more. The Nile. As I mentioned earlier, river cruising is becoming an increasingly popular choice of cruising amongst cruise tourists. And the Nile has become a very popular destination for this. There are many ways to cruise the Nile. Cruise packages range from luxury cruises to something more cut back and affordable. Cruises vary in duration too, but most commonly they last between three to seven days. The Nile cruise has been deemed as one of the world's best cruises, and it's a fantastic way to see what Egypt has to offer. The Yangtze. Being the world's third longest river, it's no surprise that it's also a popular river cruise destination. Almost 100 different cruise ships operate along the Yangtze. This is an amazing way to soak up some of the sights of rural China and is particularly popular with Chinese domestic tourists. Around the world cruise. Around the world cruises are quite literally cruises that travel around the world. Around the world cruises are probably the most expensive type of cruise that you can do. They generally cost anything up from around 9,000 pounds. Some of the most luxury around the world cruises can cost up to 200,000 pounds per person. These cruises typically last around 90 to 120 days and they allow for passengers to embark and disembark in various different places around the world. The Arctic. Arctic cruising is often referred to as a form of extinction tourism, whereby passengers travel to the Arctic to observe the distinct wildlife or culture while it's still there. Most people who take an Arctic cruise are wealthy adventure seekers, wishing to explore the natural wildlife and landscapes of remote locations. So as I mentioned earlier, cruise tourism is very popular and it is continuing to grow. This industry not only makes a large amount of income directly, but also it makes a lot of income through its partnerships and integration with other parts of the tourism industry. However, it's not always as good as it seems. The reality is that this economic benefit is absorbed predominantly by the large corporations who own these cruise ships and there is very little economic benefit of cruise tourism to the destinations that host the tourists. Because their every need is catered for on board, cruise tourists typically spend very little money in the destinations that they visit, meaning that the local people reap few rewards for this type of tourism. In addition to this, cruise tourism can have devastating impacts on the natural environment when ships dock in shallow waters or when garbage is not disposed of responsibly. And last but definitely not least, large numbers of tourists visiting a destination at one time can have adverse effects with over-tourism being a distinct problem around the world that often results from cruise tourism. So cruise tourism is big, it's exciting, but it does have some negative impacts too that really need to be managed a little bit better, I would say. Are you a cruise tourist? What do you like about cruise tourism? Let me know in the comments and watch this one next.